Turn with us over in the book of Luke in the 17th chapter. That gray speckled bird that he's saying about is not only Israel, but it's the church. He's talking about the church. Amen. I, I want to be ready to go. Amen. When he calls. So uh, God is good. Luke in the 17th chapter and verse number 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, carried on business as usual, preoccupied, everything else going on. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Matthew parallels that in chapter 24, verse 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days they were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Back in Luke the 17th chapter, verse 28, he said, likewise also in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Verse 32, he says, remember Lot's wife. Remember, she looked back because she was lusting after the things that she was leaving. Got her eyes in the wrong place, turned into a pillow of salt. Verse 33, it says, Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you today most of all for who you are. Thank you, Father, for the word, the power of your word. Lord, it's your power, God. This word is. This word, God, I like what Brother Daniel said when he was praying. Lord, we can read the word, but the word reads us. The word, Lord, finds us where we at. In fact, James talked about it being a mirror. And Lord, that's what we'll be talking about tonight. Which mirror are you looking in? I hope everyone will come back and hear the good word. But, Father, this word is a mirror. It reflects who we really are spiritually, Lord. It lets us know who we are to ourselves. Father, teach us this morning what we need to hear in the day that we're living, God. Lord, the rapture of the church could take place while we're in this service today. It's how close we are. Father, help us all be prepared for that time to come up hither. We love you today forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're living in the most convenient time. Think about it. Man has ever lived. I mean, all the modern conveniences. You know, you hear tell that uh, back years ago that when it was cold weather that someone would have to go down to the church several hours ahead of time and build a fire. Warm the building. Now I got it on my phone. I can change these thermostats on my phone from my home. Just got to put in. <laughs> but got to be in. But I mean, the modern convenience is the, uh, I mean, we don't have to come in a horse and buggy or walk to church. We rode flying down the road and still can't get here on time. Amen. I, I'm not bashing you. I'm glad you came. <laughs> It better be late than never. <laughs> but we're living in the most convenient time. How many agree with that? That man has ever lived. But we understand it. We can read in, in the book of Daniel in the 12th chapter, verse 4, he told him to seal up the words of the book until the time, seal up the book even to the time of the what? End. Many shall run to and fro, and what knowledge shall be 
increase. It's not that man is smarter than all them other for thousands of years, man walked everywhere they went to. But you know, in the beginning, God created everything and hadn't created since. In other words, every automobile and every computer and every modern thing that was, is here today was already here. And man walked over it for thousands of years. But then here in this last 100 or so years, God just turned down and turned up knowledge to get things ready for this end. Men are running to and fro, aren't they? I mean, how many times will we see a car go that way and this way while we're in here for a couple of hours? You know? They're going to and fro. They're everywhere. They don't know where they're going. They're too busy. How about going to church? I'm too busy, too busy. I, I can't get it all done. It's the most convenient time we've ever lived. What if we lived back in the time when people had to go out and cut firewood and bring it to church and start the fire? Or what if we had to walk for 10 miles or ride a horse or, you know, I mean, the time we're living when you wash clothes with a scrub board, you put it in an air, push a button and walk away. I mean, all the modern conveniences that, that gives us so much of this time that we could be doing more for God, but yet we fill it with junk. We fill it all with junk. Inert ingredients. You know, you can buy some apple juice from the store and it'll tell you on the, on the label in big letters, it'll say 100% apple juice. So praise God, this is 100%. No, read the fine print. 10% is apple juice and that 10% is 100%. <laughs> but it's got 90% inert ingredients. Water and sugar. So don't be fooled by the labels. Are you with me? Amen. We're living in the most convenient time man has ever lived, yet man is, is seemingly more busy, more preoccupied with so much to do. Can you agree with me? Amen. Can you agree with me? Amen. Agree with me today now. Come on now. Amen. If y'all help me, we'll get through this thing in a few minutes, but if y'all don't, it's gonna take several hours to get through it. There's no time for God, no room for God in the end. We got two busy schedules. We're distracted from the real reason of life. Life is not about all these things we got to do. That's not what life's all about. In fact, you go to someone on their dying bed uh, grasping for the last few breaths of air on this earth and they don't say, I wish I'd have spent more time at the office or I wish I'd have went on and done all these other things. No, they'd have said, I wish I had put God first in my life and done more for God. Are you with me? The book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, if you read the book, it's, a, it's kind of a confusing book because it represents life. And life sometimes is confusion. Conf confusing. I get confused a lot of times in life, don't you? Not as bad as Joe Biden, but I get confused, you know? But we understand and we see that Solomon sent out on a journey to, to try to figure out why are we here? You know, we live and die. The third chapter says it's time to be born, time to die. I mean, what, what are we here for? Where's happiness? Where's value at? Where's completeness at? Where's fulfillment of life at? And he tried everything he could try. He tried wine and women and he tried houses and, and orchards and vineyards and he, he tried lands and everything that you could experience in life. And 36 times he said, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he said, vanity, all is vanity. You know what vanity is? Worthless. Worthless. Empty. All those things don't bring happiness. Oh, if I could get a bigger house, or if I could get a better job, if I could just didn't know, you gotta put God first. That's what makes it, my friends. I've already been there. I've been all out there. I got a drawer full of t-shirts to prove I've been there. And there's nothing in all that. But when I came to the Lord, I began to find happiness and true fulfillment of life. And the whole book is 12 chapters long. And he gets to the last few scriptures there in the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes. 
And he says in verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Let me just tell you why, why we hear. This is, this is, if you're not doing this, you're missing out. He said, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Without it, you can't be complete. That's what he said. There's missing parts. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We'll be judged by God by what we did do or didn't do. The sin of omission and the sin of submission. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's telling us. And he says that the days of Noah and Lot are like today. People didn't recognize God. When Noah, he, the Bible said he was a preacher of righteousness building the ark. He didn't say how much he preached. He just says a preacher of righteousness. If he's a preacher of right, righteousness, he's going to be preaching. <laughs> but he was building the ark. And all the time that he was there, the people would maybe see him and think, Wow, what is this here? Just like that song. I don't know if you listen to the words of the great speckled bird there, but he says people are watching. They're watching the church. The church does any little thing wrong. Oh, you ain't got nothing. Well, let me tell you, some hypocrites at church too now. Don't, hello, if you believe everybody's a saint in church, you, you badly fooled. Amen. I bet a few of them through the years, but I... Uh, well, bro, well, well, what do you think? We don't think you're the hypocrite. <laughs> I hope no, I'm not. I, I try to live this book here. <laughs> you know. God's good, isn't he? Amen. But he, we pre Noah was preached the righteous people just looking at him and watching. Yeah. And he was probably warning there's judgment coming. God told me to build this ark. That ark is Jesus. The Lord told me to preach Jesus and get everybody in Christ because judgment is coming. The end is coming and you gotta get in Christ. You gotta be in Christ. Not just know him. If you was in an airplane and you was 30,000 feet in the air and any moment they told you that, that you know, that, that any moment that door's gonna open and you gotta go out that airplane and you saw a parachute laying in the floor and you say, I'm gonna be okay because I believe in that parachute. Will that parachute save you? No, you gotta put it on. Amen. And let me tell you, everybody could laugh at you. Look at him sitting there with that, air, with that parachute on. Look at him. He's all uncomfortable and all bulky around him. And, and you know, they making fun and mocking you and laughing at you uh, with that parachute on. Uh, but you know the importance of that parachute. Uh, they don't understand uh, that door's about to open. And when I go out, I'm going to be safe. Uh, what is going to be with you when you go out? Uh, are you going to be prepared? Think about it. Are you with me this morning? Hey, I don't find these messages online. This is ordained by God. God is speaking to us today. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to understand and see. He said in Luke, the 12th chapter, verse number 15. And he said, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life or his happiness consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. It's not how many has got the most toys. They ain't happiness. But when you come to God, he'll give you all the toys. <laughs> a lot of people out there trying to get all the toys. They ain't got time for God, but if you come to God, he'll give you all the toys. <laughs> Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things of life shall be added unto you. Ain't God good. Oh, help us, Lord. Then he spake this parable. It said a certain ground of a, or the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful and he thought with himself, this man with six eyes in the Bible and still couldn't see. What shall I, one, do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater barns and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, 
eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thy fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, and then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? I've done so many funerals, I can't remember them all in my 30, 30, almost 37 years of pastoring here. And I've never seen an armored car behind any of them. Naked we come into this world and it is certain, or we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we shall carry nothing out. Verse 21, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. But God's got to be first. He's not going to be second. Uh, Hebrew said he's a jealous God. My wife wouldn't let me bring another woman around. No, and I wouldn't let her bring another man around. No, I'm jealous. And she's jealous. Hello? Why do we think God would allow us to run around on him? Come on now. Other gods. One of the big ten was, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Help us, Lord. You see, things, things will never bring happiness and fulfillment. But people are after so many things and they, and they can't let go because it's their treasure. And the Bible said where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be too. Your attention, your life, your vision. You know how they catch a monkey? They put a box out there and they put a hole in it just big enough to him slide his hand in. And they put a piece of fruit in there and he'll grab that fruit and then he can't get it back out of the hole because his hand's like this now. And he'll pull and pull and he'll see them coming but he won't let go of that fruit and they'll catch him. What are you holding on to? Amen. Luke 14 and 16, it says a, a man, a certain man made a, a great supper and bade or called, invited many and his servant to, and sent his servant at supper time to say unto them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. And they with one consent began to make excuse. That word means they declined or they shunned or they refused or rejected it. Or they depreciated it. In other words, they, they reduced the value of this call, the importance of it. The first said unto him, I, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. It's not an excuse, is it? An excuse really is reason packed in a lie. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and, and I go to prove them. Go check them out. I, I bought them as a, a pig and a poke. I got to go see what I bought. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. I can understand that one probably better. Oh, he, he was close to having excuse there. Remember Paul said, he said, it's better not to marry. I, I was talking to one guy in the plant where I used to work he said, the reason Paul put that there, he was a homosexual. I said, man, get out of here. No such thing. That's why it's, don't marry, you know. I say, uh, people got some weird ideas about the word. I spent a few hours in this book here. Listen, Paul said it's better not to marry, but if you can't contain yourself, it's better to marry than to burn. Reason said it's better not to marry because sometimes when the Lord wants you to go do something, the wife does too. <laughs> Hello, which one are you going to do? Should I go or should I stay? <laughs> should I go or should I stay? <laughs> Can I get a witness? All you chicken fellas, raise your hands. You know I'm telling you the truth. Look at me like I'm the only one in here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm the head of my house, Brother Whitfield. I said, yeah, but your wife is the neck that turns that head, buddy. 
Are you with me? Hmm. Verse 21, it says, so the servant came and showed his Lord these things. I could say that. Lord, I have preached and preached and preached and preached everything you give me, and I just got a handful of people that accept your word. <laughs> they won't come. They won't come. What I do? Give me greater messages. Give me, give me five-hour messages instead of one. <laughs> uh, uh, help us, Lord. So the servants came and showed the Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being what? Angry. Said to his servants, in verse 21, go out quickly to the streets and the, and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the main and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done and thou hast commanded. And yet there is room. Wow. I told you, my dad said one time, said, Riding down the road, he said, Lord, why hadn't you come back for the church yet? Why didn't the rapture take place yet? And he said, answered him back and said, I ain't got enough to run my kingdom yet. Boy, I, I can imagine back in my mom and dad's days, a lot of people get saved and stuff and live for God. But these days, it's hard to get anybody convinced to serve God. Amen. I mean, I, I, I've been hearing some noise around a lot of Pentecostal churches even. A lot of churches that bring in people in and teach people it's okay to drink. Church I was brought up in the denomination that my dad preached in all his life. They got people in there drinking and stuff. I mean, come on, man. Well, yeah, brother, if it's okay, because Jesus, you know, he turned the water and wine. You go ahead and believe that if you want to. In fact, just get you a glass of water and pray over it. If it turns to wine, you drink it. If it stays water, you drink water. That's the spiritual. Jesus did spiritual things. Amen. He was showing the difference in the Old Testament and New Testament. Man, which is six, and God, the fulfillment of it. He turned the whole well into, water, into wine. Not just that little old six vessels. He told them now draw. Whole well was. God's got more than enough. Hallelujah, the New Testament. Oh, thank you, Lord. He said, verse 23, And the Lord said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel. Bend their arms. Do we do that, church? Do we do that? Do we bend their arms? Or we just say, You don't want to go to church, do you? <laughs> I mean, you know, You don't want to go to church, do you? Do we really entice them to come in do we compel them to come in do we that my house may be say it filled verse 24 for I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden invited shall taste my supper mm. kind of sad kind of bad mm. First Peter 2 and 6 it says Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, set aside, rejected, refused, the same is made the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, uh, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, uh, whereunto uh, also they were appointed. So we understand he's talking about building the pyramid. The pyramid is four-sided, uh, flat on the bottom, four-sided all the way, and all there's several stones in there that appears the same uh, uh, in different locations, whichever side it's on. Uh, but then when you get it all the way to the very top, there's one stone that's different than every other stone. And while there was building the stone, it represents a life. When you're building a life, there's a stone you keep stumbling over, that chief cornerstone, and you, and you trip over it. You say, well, I ain't got time for this. Move that thing out of the way. And you trip on it again. Maybe a, a Lord convicts you, a co-worker, a witness to you, come to deliver his tabernacle, and that old preacher up there hollers at you, and he convicts you hard, and you, and you push it aside, and you keep building your life, and you think you got everything together, and you get to the very end, and that chief Cap block on the top is Jesus. And without him, 
you're not complete. Are you with me? You got something missing in your life. And that's who it is. Jesus Christ. Luke 20 and 17 it says, and, and he beheld them, talking about Jesus, uh, and said, what is this uh, then that is written the stone which the builders rejected the same is become the head of the corner whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken amen in other words it'll break the things away from us it'll break the chains away from us that Satan has on us and give us a free life but on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind him to powder this word right here is a word that will save your soul but it'll be open in judgment to condemn that person that never accepted Jesus Christ, the same word. Are you with me? Just a little bit more. Ephesians 3.20, the last part, it said Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. Genesis 6 and 3, it says, this is the time when Noah found grace in the sight of God. We're still talking about Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. That word strive means to keep him straight. Try to, try to, I'm trying to keep him straight. My spirit ain't going to always try to keep him straight. I'm just going to let them go and do what they want to do. You know, when we... A lot of people say, well, I went to church, but I left the same way I came. No, you don't. You, no one ever comes to church and leaves the same way you come. No one. You either get closer to God or your heart gets a little more hardened, calloused. The next time you won't feel it quite as much. You may not notice it, but time after time and not obeying God, you become callous. Like the calluses on your hand. And it toughens your heart. He says, my ear's not dull, cannot hear. And my hand's not short, cannot reach. But your iniquities has callousized your heart. Amen. That's Isaiah 59, 1, 2. Those taking notes. My spirit shall not always strive with man. We're living in a time just like the days of Noah. We're living in the time like in Sodom. Does anybody here not know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Lot, his family. We're living in those days. Just like it. In fact, he said in Romans, in the, in the first chapter, verse 22, it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I tell you, we're living in the most... Convenient time man's ever lived. I mean, we think we're something, don't we? We're smarter than them past generations. In fact, some church people say, well, we've learned better now. <laughs> you give me them old timers in here. Amen, any day. Hey, uh, I take my dad preaching, my mama's praying, amen, any day of the week compared to these young whippersnappers coming in. My dad said they'll beat, might beat me to church, but they won't know what to do when they get there. Amen. We understand and we see that professing themselves to be wise. We've educated God out of the churches. Uh, we've even educated them out of the schools and the colleges, uh, out of the government. Come on now. We, come on, because we're, we're, we're smart. Well, we're smarter than God. We know more than God knows now. Verse 23 says, And change the glory of the incorruptible God into the image make like unto corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves uh, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. That's what we're doing today. We're serving ourselves more than we're serving God. I gotta please me. It's all about me. Lord, If I, it's about me, God, me. Am I wrong this morning? Am I preaching the truth? Verse 26, for this cause God gave them 
up to vile affections. Even their women did not did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, same way, men also leaving the natural use of women burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men. Remember the angels that came down to Sodom? Met Lot was out there in the gate. He's at the gate, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Vexed. Mute the drums over there. Thank you. I think it'll do it. It didn't do it. Hold on. It gives me a hum when it turns off. It'll turn off after a while. Hold on. I don't like distractions. <laughs> Are you with me? The angels came to Lot at the gate. And he carried them to the house. And he went into their house. And the men of the city banging on the doors. Let us in. We want to know them guys. We want to have sexual relations with them guys. You brought some strangers in. It's in your Bible. You know why the judgment of God ain't come on in this world yet? Because the church is still here. But the moment the church goes out of here, friends, it says when Sodom, when Lot and his family went out of Sodom, it rained judgment upon Sodom then. Brother Whitfield, I might not be on the first bus load. I won't be on the second one. No, you better be on the first bus load getting out of here. Men with men working with that, which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meet, suitable. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate, Mind. What does that mean, Brother Whitfield? That means that they don't see anything wrong with it. They're blinded by the sin. It means morally depraved. It means unprincipled. It means loss of logic and morality in their reasoning. A reprobate mind is given over to ir irrational pursuits of sin that are destructive to the soul and body and also the people around them. That's what it means. Help us, Lord. It says, 1 Peter 3 and 20, let, let's just jump on down to Proverbs. Let me just get on down. I need to let y'all go. Proverbs 1 and 22. He said, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? That means foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1 and 18 said, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of of God. How long will you love this foolishness? And the scorners delight in their scorning. That scorning means laughter, mocking. It means derision. In fact, Jeremiah said, I'm in a derision daily. He was known as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah. Oh, I can't wait to meet some of these guys. I saw a movie about him. I, I didn't really understand until I saw that, that movie about him. And man, they made up lies about him. Said, you, you make up a lie, we'll spread it. He was in derision daily, mocking, laughing at him. Oh, oh. I remember when I was at the plant, I'd walk in, I was a supervisor, so it'd be other supervisors at the pot line, and I'd walk through there, you know, and walk in the, in the pot line shift supervisor's office, and there'd be maybe, you know, five or six supervisors laying there, and I'd come walking in and said, this is back in the PTL, you know, Jim Baker days, and Jimmy Swaggart, and he said, 
said, there's old PTL, Pastor Lady. Pastor Luke, there's old PTL. Now, the hourly guys didn't do that, but the supervisors would. I'd just tell you, that's fine. Didn't bother me, because I know it wasn't true. Amen? God's good, isn't he? Jeremiah said, I'm, I'm a derision daily. Mockers and scorners. You going to keep that parachute on? <laughs> Take it off. <laughs> uh, those coming instruments. He says, fools hate knowledge. He said, turn ye at my reproof. Behold, if, if, or I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words to you. In other words, people hear the call of God, the invitation of God in this last day and they said well I don't I ain't got time today I, I, I don't want to I don't know if I can live that life none of us did none of us did he said verse 24 listen to this close now he said because I have called remember the supper he called and bid them to come and you refused I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded I, I've said Brother David, I sent preachers, I sent witnesses, and people talk to you, trying to talk to you about your soul. But none but ye have, verse 25, has said it in all, all my counsel, and would none of my reproofs. I also will laugh at your calamity, and I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and the, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Remember what it said about Esau? You know the story of Esau. Esau sold his birthright. It's like, it's like you just not taking advantage of your birthright. He sold his birthright for a pottage of whatever it was. A little bowl of... And the Bible said that he sought repentance carefully with tears and could not find it. Well, Brother Whitfield, one of these days, I'll make up my mind to come to the Lord. That ain't the way it works, friend. He has to be the one giving the invitation. And that's what's taking place right this moment in this service is an invite to come into the kingdom of God. The Lord is inviting every one of us to live with him forever. Amen. What? Man, I'm going to take advantage of that. I don't know where you stand with God today, but it'd be okay if we all just made sure it was all right. The day which we're living, friend, we might not make it out this door before the rapture church takes place or this heart quit beating. Sister Bonnie just went to the funeral of her brother-in-law and while she was up in Virginia a nephew was killed. And friends, we don't know. Do we? But I know this for a fact that right now the invitation is given. If you need the Lord today when I ask you to stand just keep coming. If you want to just... Reaffirm your commitment to God. Just make sure things are right. Just, I mean, we carry a car and get it tuned up and aligned and get it checked out, but what do we do with our soul? So whatever you need today, just respond to it. Are you ready? On three, here we go. One, two, three. 